up, gamers? I'm Jason. I'm Julie. And today on Dyson Dragons, we are going to be reviewing Quirky Circuits, published by Plat Hat Games and designed by Nikki Valens. Now, this is not the first Nikki Valens game that we have reviewed. We also did Legacy of Dragonhold, and she's done quite a few other games that uh, we've played. Now, Julie, there's something special about this that we need to let everyone know. Yes, this is a review copy, so we'd like to thank Plat Hat Games for the review copy, but we'd like to remind everybody that though this is a review copy, our opinions are our own. Now tell them more about the game itself. So this is a cooperative game um, that is intended for ages 8 and above, though I think Jason and I, we've talked about it, I think uh, we could we could definitely play with 6 year olds. Yeah, I think. I think you can go a little bit younger, though may need a little bit more help. There's even some rules in the rule book that do suggest that you just play the game with your cards face up if you would like to play with younger kids. Yeah. Uh, so it's a two to four player game uh, and it plays in about 15 to 30 minutes a game. Now about the two to four player game, uh, I guess we'll get into it a little bit, but uh, in the review, uh, we only played it two. Uh, our little one's a little too young to play yes, it. Yes, he any. is eight months, not eight years old. And we were hoping to get a chance to try this at a higher player count, but it just didn't materialize, unfortunately, with everything going on in uh, the past year. Yeah. So, I will now take it away and tell you more about Quirky Circuits. What are you doing? Well, you are in, I believe it's Robotopia or Robotville. I'm drawing a blank right now. In any case, it is a world of robots. You need to program your robot in order to complete specific actions and complete the objectives on your map. And what's really cool about the map is that it is a storybook. So you just flip open the book, place your minis, place your tokens, and you're good to go. There's no boards. And I really like uh, that feature. We'll talk about that more in the review. Mm -hmm. So there are four different types of robots. They each play differently. For example, you've got Gizmo, who is the cat that is going to be moving around, cleaning up dust bunnies. We have the Twirl, the bee, mm -hmm. who needs to take different things from flowers, basically pollen. I think it's pollinating, not quite sure in any case. Picks things up, drops them off in specific locations. You've got Rover the dog that even is able to leap over objects and has some terrain in their map, which is pretty cool. Then lastly, you've got Lefty, who is trying to serve all of the, of the cats of Robotopia the delicious sushi that they crave. So. In a little bit more detail than I normally do, but there's different features of the game and we just want to cover all of it. So Julie, tell the viewers what time it is. Well, it's time to grab our drinks. Grab our best friend. We gotta take it to the table one more time. One more time. Let's uh, see how Lefty plays before we do the review. Now we're going to take a quick look at the components for Quirky Circuits. As always, we'll start with the rule book that I do have off to the side. So we do have a very short rule book. It has all the information that you need to play the game, a nice overview of the instructions, as well as the iconography that you're going to need to play the game. It's very easy to get to the table, and I do like that we've got the uh, clarifications uh, on the back of the rule book as well. So let's start by taking a look at the different robots that we have in the game. So we've got Gizmo, his instructions are here, and then you can see a breakdown of the different cards that he has. Now on the reverse side, we do have Lefty. So you have the instructions for two robots on each of these character tiles. So here we've got Rover, his instructions, his list of cards, and on the back it's Twirl with their list of cards. Now let's take a look at the miniatures. So here we've got Twirl, the flying bumblebee robot. I really like the way these miniatures look. They fit perfectly with the theme and the style of the game. We've got Rover who is just absolutely adorable. I think this is, well, I don't think, I know that it is my favorite miniature. We've got Lefty. The serving robot does a great job of getting uh, those cats their food. And Crazy Gizmo, who is also very cute and probably your favorite if you're a cat lover, who will be cleaning up those dust bunnies. Now, here are the cards for all the different characters. And as you can see, they've got different symbols on the back, just to give you all well, the other players an idea as to what you've played. Now, each character will have their own. You can tell which 
is which just by the images. So you've got cards for Lefty, Rover, Twirl, and uh, one of these Twirl ones is upside down. And then we've got Gizmo. Some of his are upside down uh, as well. Not sure why I didn't straighten them out, but you can see what they do. Reverse, forward, turn, double forward, special ability to pick up, flip 360, jumping for Rover. So you get a good idea as to what you're going to be using. Now, when you're playing the game, you're only going to be using the decks for specific robots. Now, we do have these yellow ones, which are also related to the specific robots and do different things. For example, this accelerates the sushi and the conveyor belt when you're playing lefty. And they can also provide different uh, inconveniences for you as typically in the rules, you will have to play these yellow cards first before you can play any other cards. Now I'm not gonna really explain what all of these tokens are. You can see we got some food, a package, vases that can be knocked over and destroyed. I think this is an extra speed. We haven't actually used uh, that arrow. Got some dinosaur fossils over here, dust bunnies, cats, and food. The instructions are, are in the scenario book, so you'll get that information when you need it. Here you've got the battery icon that'll help you keep track of the turns and how long you have to complete a scenario. Then we've got the scenario book, which I absolutely love as a book. As you can see, you will just open it up. You'll get the instructions for the current scenario and then over here you've got the map which will tell you exactly what you need to be doing so there you have it we've taken a look at the components for quirky circuits now we're going to set up the game and then teach you how to play now we're going to teach you how to set up quirky circuits so we're going to be using a scenario with gizmo we want to use one that has the special rules like the cards just so that uh, you'll get a good idea as to what you're doing now you want to set the battery marker at the top level you need to place the required tokens and you can see over here in the setup instructions what you're going to be doing so we need to place out all of the dust bunnies i believe i took out all of the tokens if not well i will uh fix that uh <laughs> Before we actually get the game started but it does look like I do have everything that I need and then I do need to place two vases in the required locations we'll then place our robot in the direction that is uh, listed right there you'll also want to have the rules for gizmo what I like to do is often just like to put it in the uh, in the book You'll see right here, it just gives us the goal. Clean up all the dust bunnies with Gizmo and return it back to the starting space before its battery reaches zero. So once you know what the goal is, you can really just put the tile in a nice location. And there you have it, you're good to go. So the game is very easy to set up. You'll then need to make sure you've got the right card. So you'll take out all the cards related to Gizmo and that's going to make up your deck. Then you will need to add the special cards and it'll tell you what to add. So in this case, we need two turns for Gizmo and the extra fast, the double movement. And those will get added into this deck, which you're then gonna shuffle up and deal to the players. But as you saw, very easy to set up the board. We'll deal out the uh, the stacks of cards right now. I just wanna make sure I get a nice shuffle, try to get these yellow cards not all stacked uh, together. They may get mixed together as we keep shuffling, but that's just the way things go. And then you'll deal out five cards. This is a two player game. Five, five. So there you have it. We've got player one's hand, player two's hand. The board's all set up. So we're now going to zoom out a little bit to give us ourselves a place to play the cards. We're going to teach you how to play the game. So how do you play Quirky Circuits? Well, you need to play five cards that are going to program your robot with specific commands that they will then execute. You also need to follow any special rules. For example, in this one, the player that has a yellow card must play that card before they can play any other command cards. So we've got player one's cards here, player two's cards here, a nice play space over here, 
And the cards that we do need are just going to be off camera. We're gonna keep these things separate so that we have a nice play space. Now you may want to communicate non-verbally because as you can see over here that there is a double movement that is the yellow card. Hopefully that's the one we got. So yeah, as you can see, we got the perfect one that's going to put Gizmo there. So maybe you want to smile at the other player to let them know that, hey, I've got the perfect card. So player one has to play this yellow card first before they can play anything else. We'll take a look at the hand and see what we have. Well, we can turn them 360, we can back them up. So nothing great really for a second move. So maybe you want to try flashing the cards at your, your compatriots, the people you're playing with, the other players, trying to get them to see if they've got something that may work a little bit more to your advantage. So you can see Gizmo's going this way, we turn them right. That's not really what we want to do. Gizmo this way. So we, we really don't have any good turn cards for Gizmo. So we're not in the best situation. However, if Gizmo collides with an obstacle, it will halt its movement and rotate to the left. So that's something that you might want to consider as well. So we'll take a look. Do we have a one forward? So nothing great, but we've got a one forward. We'll play that. Then you got to kind of figure out what's going on. Did it rotate? Did we do things the right way? And having them bump into stuff, except for the vases, as they will break and you'll have to clean them up, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So remember, he rotates to the left. So left, it's not so bad. Fortunately, we don't necessarily want him to collide with something else. So we maybe, yeah, we'll try this. Uh, no, that's just going to, actually, it's not a bad thing. And just a reminder, if you've not read the rule book, I'm really using this to learn entirely how to play. You can play as many cards as you want. So for example, this triple is gonna have a bump there and turn left, meaning we'll wanna play this 360 right away so that we'll get him going in the right direction. Now this, it, these are player two cards here. We only have the reverse, nothing great. Maybe we just want to shrug our shoulders as player two and let player one play the next card if it looks like they have what they need. Now I'm just gonna leave this face up so I remind myself which player is which. Let's go ahead and execute the robot's program. So we've got the double here. So there we go, picked up one of the dust bunnies. We then advance one, which we bump, rotate to the left. We now shoot forward three, we bump, and we will then rotate to the left. Now, if we bumped the vase, it would have fallen over and crashed and we would have to clean it up. We then execute the next command, which is a 360. And then we've got the forward command, which has us moving one forward. So that is the end of the turn. We lower the battery. These cards then go into the discard pile and we will deal out another set of cards. Now we always start with the lowest player. So we will deal one to player one, one to player two, and then another three off the top to player one. They get them back up to their full count. Now, just for the sake of teaching the game, I'm gonna swap, well, I'll swap a turn card with this card, because this is gonna be the last portion of the how to play it. Pretty sure that after, at this point you get an idea. Now, unfortunately, we missed that dust bunny. We might wanna try to go back and get it but we'll see how everything plays out. So we'll look at player one's cards and I'm dropping one here. Let's see what we got. So we can move forward to pick up a dust bunny and start moving up. Maybe we do want to try to get that dust bunny and oh, we left this one. So I'll just put these face up right now. Let's take a look at what we got here. So we do, so with this one, unfortunately it turns Gizmo the wrong way. It's the first thing that we, we would have to play. And let's let player one play. Because we'll just look, be like, yeah, we'll point to the yellow card, say, hey, we've, we've got to play that one. So let's see what we have. Thought we had something that would turn them the right way. No, so no matter what we're doing, we're sort of turning them the wrong way with these cards. But maybe we've got the 360. So let's see what we got here. So I always like to do this. So we'll go like that. And since you know what's been played. We already played the double player. One should know that, hey, you played the turn, which way the turn's going. Play the 360 and the forward, we'll be able to grab that dust bunny. 
Now we don't have another 360 per se, but what else can we do? Well, we can play the back up and then look at start putting Gizmo in the right direction. So let's go ahead and execute the program. So we take a look, Gizmo goes this direction and I'll flip him for 360. Goes ahead one. Then we can go ahead and back up one. Then we turn him. So let's just, I always do this whenever I'm not sure. So then he's now pointing this direction. And battery goes down once again by one and play is going to continue. You would then deal out the remaining cards. Once you run out of cards, you reshuffle the discard pile, which will now have all of these cards in it. Now we have not, uh, apologies for the quick fade, just like the robot can run out of juice, which would then lead you to losing the game. Our camera just ran out of juice and since it fit with the theme of the game, we decided to leave it in. So as we were saying, we hadn't fully gone over the environmental effects. So they're all detailed there. Obstacles will halt your movement immediately. If you do happen to hit the vase, it will be knocked over and you must clean it up. And chairs will slow you down if you go through them with a forward two or a forward three. So everything that you need is in every specific scenario. The rules for Gizmo, such as how he rotates left, are on his character card. Now, we've covered how to play the game. Julie and I will be coming back at you with our review of Quirky Circuits. So keep it right here. We'll come back uh, as soon as we get time to charge up our battery. So Quirky Circuits, what did you think of the game? Well, I, I like the, uh, the little, I, I like minis. <laughs> I'm pretty consistent. I think they're cute. I, I think they're age appropriate. Uh, they're fun for a fun family game. And I think they definitely add to the game. I also think that the art works very well with the, the feel of the game, the, the book. I was gonna say, everything's I was about, very colorful. Yeah, I was going to get to the, I also think it's pretty, I mean, you, you, you touched on it in the intro. Uh, I like the fact that it's a book uh, and that it plays, you know, like the, the, the map is there and I like the art for it as well. So I agree with you. I think it's, uh, I think it's different and I, uh, I enjoyed it. I think it's, it's definitely very appropriate for a family friendly game. Yes. Now we only played this at two players and playing it with just adults. So I just want to comment. We did find the experience a little lackluster. That being said, we do see where the game will shine playing with four players, playing with kids, especially when you're able to teach them programming, problem solving, and how they have to work together to get the robot to do different things. Also, Without talking. Yes, without talking, which is a big aspect of it. So you're going to want to be using some nonverbal communication, which we did do uh, as well. So we'll talk a little bit about how that worked. Sometimes it worked very well. Other times, I think we confused the heck out of each other. So uh, depending on the time of day, you know, that, that married brainwave was in sync or completely out of sync. So that's just the way that uh, it worked out. I was going to say, I think uh, this game definitely, uh, definitely shines, as you said, for uh playing teaching teaching kids uh a lot of different skills especially board board game skills i would say i think this is a good game uh to to help uh to help build on that as you pointed out i think that for you know two adults or three adults even or i'm probably i mean it'd be more fun at four i would think mm -hmm. but for the two of us this is just you know doesn't add the challenge that we're looking for you know no and don't get us wrong, some of these are definitely fairly challenging. There's definitely some luck involved. In particular, we didn't, so we're just talking a little bit about the negatives. We didn't enjoy Lefty as much just because of the way the conveyor belt works and you, the way you have to draw those cards. Our plays with them are just kind of like, well, if we don't get things moving fast enough or depending on the positioning, we could be a little bit out of luck. You also have less time with the battery indicator, so it just wasn't our favorite. I really enjoyed Rover, honestly. I've, uh, I mean, uh, I did not enjoy enjoy Twirl. Uh, just didn't 
didn't do it for me. Rover was a lot of fun with the leaping over things and the and the different terrain that it was. I, I don't know what you think about that. No, I Rover was definitely my favorite. I think Gizmo and Rover are the two actually that you may even be able to get away with playing with kids a little bit younger because it's a very straightforward sort of mechanics that you're using because you're moving around, picking something up, dropping it off, and there's less obstacles, there's less things that sort of happen if you do things incorrectly. Now, Twirl was very well designed in terms of having momentum and teaching kids about things like momentum, which is really cool, and I love the fact that you're getting a lot of learning experiences in the game. It just make things a little bit more complicated because it's kind of easy to forget about momentum, especially for younger players that may not uh, take those rules uh, into account. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I honestly, this is definitely, as far as I'm concerned, this is a game that's going to stay in our collection just because I look forward, even if it's gonna, years from now, uh, to playing with a little guy and seeing seeing how he's going to learn and, and adapt and, and play this game with us. It's also good for us to work on our nonverbal communication from time to time. I mean, we did things like, for example, if you had like, you need like that one card and then you're hopefully your partner has the other cards, we'd play the card down really quickly and then do things like a smile, eye bling, try to have some fun, maybe even play a little footsies. Where's your foot? <laughs> Can't, there it is, there it is. Found, found the foot. So we do things like that. Uh, the other thing that we recommend, especially to two players, is don't be afraid to play like almost an entire sequence because there's nothing in the rules that say you have to alternate. So if you got the right sequence or if you know you've got something that's going to work very well, we've both found that playing cards quickly basically signaled that, hey, I'm probably, well, let's just, I'll draw an example here with my fingers. Let's say that you got to pick up this square is where the thing is. You're probably got here if I want like one, two, three. Like you're right where you need to be. Just play the right card and we'll be able to then figure it out from there. Uh, the one trick that I think that I found tricky at two players was getting that last card sometimes. Yeah. If you're like, dang it, we don't quite have the right thing. What is going to be the least damaging to our play? And I do think that we really didn't, get the laps that you can get out of this if you're playing with higher family members player. and higher player accounts where things just go a little awry you're running into stuff people are giggling and having a good time but we can definitely see the potential that's there it's it's weird because i feel like we're reviewing the game at least a little bit based on uh what we see that it, that it will be able to do and what we're going to get to the table later on but that's actually a testament to how well designed the game is. Uh, typically, when we get like some, not a, not to say review copies, when we have issues with the game and it's going to be something that's not going to get a passing grade, there's something really wrong with the design itself. And even though this wasn't the most fun we've had at the table, the way that everything is supposed to work and how everything's going to integrate together at different player counts really shone through, even at the lower player count. Yeah, I think I don't think I have anything to add to that. No, I don't think there's really much more to add. This is becomes a lot of fun. You're going to teach your kids a lot of stuff, and you know, I would say focus on teaching them how to communicate non-verbally, like you know, eyes, smiles. And I, I don't even think toes. it's all, it's all about non. No, no, non but it can, but it can be a also, big part of it. It's also about how games work, you know, and and, and cooperating and, and cooperating to to get to a common goal, uh, and and also just having fun together playing something and I think getting those laughs as you said you know part of bumping into something and knocking it over and all like that's part of this game and I think that that's part of also uh the the teachable moments I think in this game so oh, there there's two things that we did need to talk about that yes. you just reminded me so a great thing about the game and it does help is the back of the cards that tell you if it's you know either going to be going straight it's one of the special abilities if it's a turn so you really want to pay attention to those and what we'd often do especially when we we're trying to decide uh what the last card was is we'd be flashing each other the hands like is my hand is my worst last card less evil than your last card so we would do things like that in other attempts to uh communicate so i just thought that that was really cool and one thing that I want to highlight, and I said two things, and the other thing just slipped my mind. I don't know. Maybe you'll think of it when you're giving it your rating. So I will start with my rating and let your brain catch up. Yes. Uh, so for me, um, this is a six and a half based on the potential 
uh, that it it could be playing with other with playing with kids, uh, playing with uh, uh, young adults. I would say um, if it was just based on my enjoyment of the game playing with you, it would have a lower score. But I really do think, as we had said, that it does. Um, it does uh, achieve what it's trying to be, and I think it's a it's a great game for that. So it's a six and a half for me. So I, I said two things. I think there really was only one. It was just highlighting the way that the cards would uh, work and interact. So that's one of the things that I really love about the game. I love the cooperation. For me, this game is a seven because uh, being the one that reads all the rule books, so there, I do know a little bit more about the rules than Julie. For example, how it will play a little bit differently at higher player counts. That's not something that we discuss going into the review so i'm giving this a seven the game is solid it's going to be a lot of fun for the family to get out around the table i do also think that this is something you can definitely have fun with uh for adults you might not be playing it in the most family friendly version i would suggest you have something like uh, i have next to me and uh, maybe you have a have a few of those and then see how well you can work together to solve the problem. Actually, there it is. Thank you, I just said it, as always. I'm, this is a problem-solving game. It's gonna teach your kids how to work together to solve different problems in interesting and creative ways because just as we were talking about the cards, like there's things that I did that you didn't expect or things that you did that I didn't expect. For example, one time Julie is looking at me like, why did you play this last card? And oh wait, you're turning us around backwards. But guess what? I played the card that let me back up and then shoot forward. And on and Beale, she had the right card in place to turn us around the corner. So sometimes things really come into place in cool manner. So it's a seven for me, solid game, great family co-op. And I think that if you've got six year olds, seven year olds, eight year olds, and you wanna have a silly fun time at the table, this is something that you absolutely need to consider adding to your collection. It's got a lot of educational value. And I think a little bit older too. Yeah, definitely older as well. I'm just saying like, if as they're as at as that as age, they're gonna definitely have fun with it. And it's something that they're probably gonna appreciate on different levels as they get older. And on that note, it's time to remind you to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified when we have some new content for you. Also, take a look down below in the video description because you'll find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So if you'd like to see pictures of Julie and I playing Quirky Circuits, failing at Quirky Circuits, well, there'll be plenty of those on the feed. And then also in the video description, if you would like to support the channel, take a look at our link to multizone.ca. It is a discount code. You will get 10% off your purchase and a portion of your purchase will be returned to the channel. So if you're looking for Quirky Circuits, they're based out of Gatineau, Quebec, take a look. We always appreciate any love that you want to give us and we love supporting local game stores. And what else do I need to say, Julie? Well, you're going to say that there's going to be video links popping up above. The one in front of Jason will bring you to our most recent video and the one popping up in front of me. Uh, do we have another Plat Hat Games review? We do not have another Plat Hat Games review. This is our first one, but we'll make sure that it is another family-style co-op game. We do have at least one more of those that we reviewed, if not two. So I'll figure it out with you which one uh, that we want to have up there. Yep. So now what do we need to do? Now it's time to grab our drinks. I'm going to have to get a little closer here yes. at this big table. <laughs> grab our best friend. I'm going to keep playing games. Keep playing games. I, I honestly would love to see how your parents react to this one. I'm pretty sure we'd have a lot of laughs with your mom. Just with her personality. It's so bubbly. Mm -hmm.